It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, Pastor Jeremy Anderson, aka the Remnant Warrior. Guys, tonight we are going to be looking at the three views, or the three main views that we have in the Church of Eschatology. And eschatology, uh, <laughs> the wiki definition of eschatology is um, the study of death and the destiny of and the finality of what happens to the soul or something like that but um a more a more proper definition a more suitable definition for today is would be the study of the end times and that is what we are going to be talking about tonight there are um three main views on end times or three main uh i guess theologies on end times and that is uh th the three eschatological views are um We've got historicism, futurism, and preterism. And each of these views of eschatology, um, they, I personally have been through at least a portion of all three of them in my, in my Christian walk. Um, I've been challenged recently. This is the reason why um, tonight we are doing this program on eschatology instead of uh the Doctrine of Christ series. I, I, I haven't stopped Doctrine of Christ by any means. That is the most in, important uh, series I've ever done, and it is by far the most in. It is the most important doctrine that we can have as followers of Christ. Um, you know, we should all form our theology around the Doctrine of Christ um, for sure. But I've been reading. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, with Brian Gadawa. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he wrote uh, the Chronicles of the Nephilim series and the Chronicles of the Watcher series. And uh, matter of fact, I think his most recent book is his uh, Chronicle of the Watchers, um, the story of uh, um, Jezebel. Um, it's going to be, a, I think, a major motion picture. Um, that is the only, I've got all of his books on Audible and I've got some of them on paperback. And uh, I, I recently just started reading uh, his Chronicles of the Apocalypse series, and I gotta say, <laughs> Brian Gadawa makes some. He's a, a partial preterist, and um, he makes some really interesting arguments. I um, I first heard his arguments for the preterist view of the end times uh, on. I think it. I knew he was a preterist from uh, reading his material and reading uh, his stuff on his website, a blog that he puts out, but I, I first heard him talk about it on um, the on a podcast with, I've got, hold on guys, I'm sorry, I'm on my phone tonight, and I forgot to cut the ringtone down, I, 
tell me I've got this headset on and it's plugged into my phone and normally I'm on the computer but tonight I'm on the phone so if I am um, if the sound quality is bad or if it's too loud please somebody tell me in the comments and I can um, unplug the, the headset because I know sometimes it does get very loud um, it echoes in here I'm I probably shouldn't have done it on the phone but yeah, it is what it is. We've already started. There's no going back now. But um, uh, the the podcast that I heard him on, that's what I was saying. The first time I heard him explain his views of preterism was on a podcast uh, with um, uh, uh, with Gons and mm, Gon Shimura and my mind's blanking right this second, but on their podcast, the guys from uh, Canary Cry, uh, they I, I heard Brian Goddard come on there twice, and the second time, you know, they really, hey, Mary, uh, the second time he, he really broke down his views of preterism, and, you know, I um, in my probably my early 20s, um, I kind of went from, the futurist um, pre-millennial uh, view that I had always had growing up to I kind of started leaning towards more of a historicist um, or preterist view. I kind of had a mix of the two. And for those of you who are just tuning in, we're, we're talking tonight about the, the three views of eschatology. And eschatology, of course, is the study of the end times. And Christians generally hold three views of eschatology, and they are, of course, um, futurism, preterism, and historicism. And for the most, by and large, I would say that um, the futurists, and, and let me say this, I want to add this at the very beginning, because it's it's very important. Um, each one of these uh, eschatological views are in a lot of ways, based on the, that particular view's um, doctrine about the millennium. You've got um, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. And, uh, and then you've got... Uh, You've got also, there's, there's actually four because premillennialism is broken down into two parts. You've got uh, your his, historic, your historically, your, I mean, historicist premillennialism, and then you've got your dispensationalism. And dispensationalism uh, is the doctrine and the, the theology that I grew up in. It is, uh, by and large, probably the, it's definitely one of the biggest accepted. Uh, theologies in the American evangelical church, especially in the Southern Baptist uh, denomination, which is how I was raised, Southern Baptist. And, um, you know, I I was always taught that dispensationalism, I, I didn't even know the word. And most, most people who hold the view of dispensationalism don't even uh, know the, the word dispensationalism, and that's okay. I didn't either. But um, by and large, Christians hold various views concerning the end of the age and that's that's a key point and key phrase the end of the age because the eschatology is the the study of the end of the age um by definition anyway and i know when i was listening to to brian gadawa in the uh, canary cry podcast um they were he, he was talking about how Matthew 24 he because his he bases all of his uh, pretty much every bit of his doctrine from what I gathered listening to him it, he bases most of his theology on Matthew 24 his the preterist view, interpretation of Matthew 24 and I got to say that a lot of the stuff that that he says is very very um, thought provoking to say the least but. Because I've already, you know, been down that road, so to speak, sort of in my, um, like I said, in my mid twenties, um, I knew all the arguments for both the historicist point of view and the preterist point of view. Um, the reason that I kind of went down that road, and I, I wasn't, I didn't go, I, I, I wouldn't say that that was my 
theology in my mid twenties, but I I was definitely thinking about it. You know, if you've heard my testimony at all, you know that in my my mid twenties I wouldn't even call myself a Christian. Um, I was someone playing Christian, and you know, so when I studied all of these things and then heard Brian Gadawa give his view on why preterism was the right way. I had all of the the answers for uh, my point of view, which is, are all the answers to combat preterism for um, futurism, which that's uh, the way that I believe now, but it's not because, and I'm not a dispensationalist. Anybody who's listened to this program or that knows me knows that I, I, I'm not a dispensationalist, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to look at these these three views of eschatology um, the best we can. You know, we're not going to be able to look at all of them in depth, but we're going to just give uh, you know a roundabout interpretation of all of them, and then we're going to go to scripture. I've got to get my Bible out. We're going to go to scripture and. We're going to see what Scripture says, and then we're going to talk about, um, you know, the the best way to decide what our eschatology should be. Um, you know, and it definitely should not be. I'm going to say this up front: we should not um, base our view on any theology, uh, be it the study of the end times or um, you know our Christian theology as a whole. We should not base our doctrine on anything a man says. Um, we should go to Scripture and, of course, let the Holy Spirit interpret these things for us and help us create and, or not create, I guess that's not a good word, but help us form doctrine. But before I break all of them down, I, I'm going to share what they all have in common, first of all. Um, Christians agree with the immortality of the soul and acknowledging that man is composed of <laughs> the material and the immaterial and at, at death the physical body dies but the immaterial essence of man um, it, it, it's compromised of, of his soul and his spirit lives in eternal and conscious state either in heaven or in hell. And secondly, the immaterial essence of man exists in an intermediate state awaiting the resurrection of the physical body. In other words, um, our spirit or our soul either goes to heaven or hell after death and our body awaits a resurrection uh, or awaits resurrection at the second coming because each of these different views pretty much all agree on the second coming being that Christ will come a second time in physical bodily form, even though uh, views like the preterist view, um, the full preterism, um, does hold that uh, everything was completed by 70 AD, and uh, we're, well, we'll go into all that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But thirdly, the Bible teaches that at some appointed time, the physical body will be resurrected and transformed into its eternal state and united with the soul and spirit of the individual, be it in heaven or in hell, what I was you know, just talking about with the, the second with the immaterial and the material body. And fourthly, the Bible teaches that there will be a divine judgment at the end of the age when the righteous will receive their reward and the unrighteous will be sentenced to the lake of fire. And furthermore, Christians agree that Christ will one day return physically to rule over the earth. And finally, all Christians look forward to the eternal state. Christ will one day create a new heaven and a new earth and judge evil once and for all. Afterwards, we will enter into the eternal state as described in Revelation verse 22. And I'm going to turn in my Bible. You guys can do the same thing to it. Revelation verse 20. We're going to look at... Uh, Revelation verse 20, because as I was telling you all earlier about um, these three eschatologic, th these three eschatology views, they're all based on um, pretty much each view's um, definition and belief of what's going to happen in the millennium. And we're going to go to Revelation 20, and we're going to look at the, the thousand-year reign here in just a minute. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, look at a few more things. The 
there are some basic beliefs that all evangelical Christians share in agreement. However, differences occur when attempting to interpret the millennial kingdom mentioned in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. Questions such as whether the thousand-year rule of Christ should be interpreted literally or symbolically begin to arise. This leads to an even bigger issue of how the book of Revelation should be explained. Are we to interpret the prophecies literally or should we interpret them allegorically? Are these future prophecies or do they describe events that happened in church history? As we go through the study of the different eschatological views, we have to understand that these are in-house, these are debates that happen in-house among Christians. And our views on the end times and prophecy should never divide us as the body of Christ. We should never make these things such as eschatology a salvation issue. And that happens, I see it so many times, especially on Facebook. People will get angry and they will just start spewing venom from behind their keyboard and it's, it gets ridiculous sometimes. But these things are not salvation issues. You know, regardless to what happens at, at the end of the age or at the end of time, they that does not have anything to do with someone accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we definitely do not need to make it a salvation issue, and we do not need to divide the body of Christ. You know, we should encourage and challenge one another to, to study the Scriptures and present our reasons and um, give theological debate with one another. Uh, you know, we should investigate these things. It it is my desire tonight in this program, you know, I want to present the overview of each of these views and then go to scripture and let you guys decide for yourselves. You know, I, I know for me that the main reason that I wanted to have this program is because early in my Christian walk, you know, not, not necessarily, not necessarily early in life, um, because I was in my, my, I guess my early 20s, mid-20s, before I um, really knew that there was any other view of prophecy in the end times other than what I was taught growing up. Um, that was really the reason why my uh, end times views started to you know, lean towards the other way, because I was angry that I was never told that there was more than just the the view that I've been taught. And that is why, you know, I want to share with everyone, although I know that there are a lot of you all watching and listening that, you know, you know all about uh, eschatology, you know about premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism, uh, you know, you know about preterism uh, and, and futurism and historicism. Uh, but I didn't. And I know that there are at the same time, there are a lot of people watching who don't know. Um, there will be a lot of people who see this program and hear the podcast version who have never heard of any of these things. And that's one of the reasons why I, that's the main reason why I wanted to have this discussion with you all tonight and also have the question and answer at the last 30 minutes. And I know that time is ticking down because I've been being a little long-winded, so I'm going to jump right into this, and I'm going to tell you guys the, the three different um, eschatological uh, approaches to the views, the, the three different uh, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all the, the definition of, of these three views and, and just give you a basic definition of them. Uh, and these three views, um, like I said, they are the three views that uh, kind of sum up historicism Preterism, I mean, preterism and futurism, and premillennialism is the first one, and premillennialism is the hallmark of premillennial eschatology is the literal interpretation of prophecy. Uh, that uh, premillennial theologians teach that there will be a series of key events that will occur before the millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And these events include the rapture of the church, a seven-year time of tribulation, and the return of Christ to establish a thousand-year rule on earth. 
premillennialists often adopt one of the three distinct rapture positions of pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, and mid-tribulation rapture. And premillennialism, uh, as I uh, told you all earlier, is actually broken up into two different categories. Um, it's broken down to um, to the the categories of historic historicist premillennialism and dispensationalism and dispensationalism hi historic not historicist i'm sorry dispensationalism is the the view of of prophecy that like i said that i had growing up and it is the view of prophecy that holds the the view of the pre-tribulation rapture and it um, also holds the view of let's see trying to pull something up that'll give me the actual definition so I'm not just giving you my definition of it um, all right it is it breaks down the the different areas of prophecy from the from into different dispensations of time and i want to tell you exactly what it says what the definition is dispensational premillennialist premillennialist hold that christ will come before a 7 year period of intense tribulation to take his church living and dead into heaven after this period of fulfillment of a after this period of fulfillment of divine wrath, he shall then return to rule from a holy city, i.e. the New Jerusalem, over the earthly nations for 1,000 years. After these 1,000 years, Satan, who was bound up during Christ's earthly reign, will be loosed to deceive the nations, gather an army of the deceived, and take up to battle against the Lord. This battle will end in both the judgment of the wicked and Satan and the entrance into the eternal state of glory by the righteous. This view is called premillennialism because it places the return of Christ before the millennial, before the millennium, and it is called dispensational because it is founded in the doctrines of dispensationalism. The, like I said earlier, the favored method of interpretation of dispensationalists is strictly literal. Dispensationalists read the Bible and study prophecy from. A literal point of view they, they take prophecy and scripture literally and I think that um, you know that is you know a good thing for the most part but dispensationalists also uh, believe that they believe in a secret coming of Christ so they hold um, Christ coming actually uh, three times that him coming in, uh, in his incarnation um, being born of a virgin as a baby, as a human first, then a uh, secret rapture of the church before the tribulation time. And then they, of course, believe in the second coming of Christ that happens at the end of the tribulation. And the if, if we look at Scripture, no matter whether we, um, what view of eschatology you know, we hold to, even if you are, because not all dispensationalists hold to a pre-tribulation rapture, but a lot of them do. The the doctrine of dispensationalism and where dispensationalism comes from definitely uh, teaches a secret pre-tribulation rapture, but not all dispensationalists believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So, um, you know, regardless to what view of eschatology you hold to, whether you're a preterist or historicist or a futurist, I think that it's important to read the Word of God and not to add anything to it. And there's absolutely, I, I don't see any way that you can get a pre-tribulation, a secret pre-tribulation rapture without adding to Scripture. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that on, um, you know, deception detection on the, the pre-tribulation rapture. And that is not something that I want to dive into tonight because I don't want to, I don't want to get off topic, but you know, pre-tribulation rapture cannot really be justified without 
adding to and just kind of coming up with things that aren't there. The, you know, the rapture of the church for the dispensationalist, it, it says that the church will be raptured before the seven-year tribulation um, or the 70th week of Daniel. And they, they also believe that Israel and the church are two distinct entities. They believe that God has a plan, a separate plan for Israel and a separate plan for the church. And that is another reason why, you know, I just, I cannot stick with dispensationalism. Um, you know, it's also, dispensationalism is a view, in my opinion, that has really hindered and hurt the pre-millennialism view um, because and it's really hurt the futurist interpretation of eschatology. The the out of the three views, the futurist, uh, historicist, and preterist views, the premillennial and the the premillennial view and the futurist view go hand in hand. The amillennial view and the um historicist view go hand in hand and the post-millennial view and preterist the preterist view go hand in hand the, the preterist view holds to a, a post-millennial view of the of the thousand year reign and the the preterist view is yeah the preterist view holds to the post-millennial view of the thousand-year reign, the historicist view holds to an amillennialist view, and the futurist view holds to the pre-millennial view of the thousand-year reign. And out of the three different studies, the three different doctrines on eschatology, the, the preterist view and the historicist view are really the two that are the least known about in the American church, you know, not a lot of people have heard of either one of them unless you are in, uh, you know, unless you're somebody who watches this program regularly or, you know, you listen to uh, the the Omega Frequency or, you know, maybe you're a, a follower of the Midnight Ride or any of the, the great... Um, truther christian truther programs uh most people unless they've been awakened to the truth that god has for all of us and the scales have been removed from their eyes most people just don't know these things and you know the the reason why i think this is important although it, it definitely can sound boring is because each of these views in their own way are man well all the way around they're man made um you know somebody has come up with a doctrine just like you know the different calvinism um wesleyanism um you know you got reformed theology all the different theological um schools the different views of the theology they're all man made my biggest point tonight is that Although there are definitely portions of truth in all of these different uh, categories and all of these different views of eschatology, it is very, very important to find the truth in all of them and only take the truth from them. It is important to find a, a, a balanced middle um, you know, take truth from the different views of and different doctrines and only take the truth. Let the Holy Spirit help you make your doctrine. Let the Holy Spirit form your theology. You know, we have so many different reasons for why we believe what we believe, but for the most part, it's because the preacher said so. You know, I, I believe this way because that's what I was taught in church. Um, that is the way it was for me anyway. Um, I know a, a lot of people um, are the exact same way. They, they do not open their Bibles, and that is what's so important for us to do. Um, you know, we should 
all spend time in the Word daily. The only time that we open the Bible should not just be when we're in the church pew and the pastor says, turn in your Bibles to chapter and verse. But I know for a lot of us, it can become this way, you know, with the different, we get distracted into the different areas of life and we uh, have to find time for Scripture. We, we <laughs> get bogged down in daily life and we forget to get in the Word and to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. But that is so important. If we do these things, then nobody can ever uh, come to us and make us believe a certain way just by fancy speech. Um, premillennialism is the view that um, I was telling you guys that is by and large the, the biggest and most widely held view, especially in the American evangelical um, church. And like I said, the hallmark of, uh, of premillennialism is the a literal interpretation of scripture and of prophecy. Um, the theologians of premillennialism, they, they teach that there will be a, a series of key events that happen before the millennial rule of Christ on the earth. And these events are supposed to, to happen right, well, they start with the rapture and then you have the different things that happen in the tribulation and then you've got the return of Christ and then the thousand year reign. And then you've got post-millennialism and post-millennial theology teaches that the church will be triumphant as a result of the church Christianizing the world. After this, Christ will then return upon which believers enter the eternal state and post-millennialists therefore apply a more allegorical approach to their interpretation of the book of Revelation. And, you know, I said something wrong a few minutes ago. I I got I got the two different uh, uh, theologies, the two different eschatological views of historicism and preterism mixed up. I said earlier that, um, that preterists held to the post-millennial view and that historicists held the amillennialist view, but... Um, I, I had that backwards. Preterism holds to um, the amillennial, amillennialism and historicists hold to postmillennialism because I know this because it, although I kind of went back in my mid-20s, although I kind of bounced back and forth between the two, I lean mostly towards a historicist point of view because my mother um, married who is today I call my dad, um, Michael Lupo. My uh, He is not my biological father, but my him and my mother got married when I was 15 years old, and he is uh, a pastor. And uh, he was he held then at the time a historicist view of of prophecy and of revelation. And you know, I had never heard anything other than what I had been taught in church. And I listened to his beliefs, and I read up on all of them, and I started leaning that way myself. But they believe the historicist view is this is really very, very important to understand. Historicists believe that uh, the church will be triumphant because, and through Christianizing, through spreading the gospel, the church will Christianize the whole world, and the world will just get better and better until Jesus comes back. Well, <laughs> if that's the case, friends, then we are in trouble, and I don't think that... Um, Jesus will ever be coming back if that is the case because, you know, the world's not getting better. I mean, all we have to do is look, turn on the TV, look at things that are going on with this, especially now with the coronavirus and all that, uh, the the different uh, horrible things that go on. Um, the world's not getting better. And if from the time of Christ's ascension into heaven until now, if, if you know, if through us spreading the gospel, if the world is supposed to be Christianized all over and get better through us in order for Christ to come, then we definitely haven't been doing our job. And I do believe that we should do that. I think that we should spread the gospel absolutely. Uh, Joshua, um, regardless um, of anybody's uh, view of what the correct name of Jesus is, um, I, uh, you know, 
I definitely am not going to get bogged down in the translation of a name. Um, I know all of the different uh, reasons for the pronunciations of the name of our Savior and the Messiah, but um, I am in no means a sacred namer. I say Yeshua just as much as I say Jesus. Um, there are so many people who get lost in things like the name of our Savior when, and they, I'm not saying you do this by any means, don't misunderstand me, I'm just saying there are people who get lost in things like the correct, the correct pronunciation of the name and the sacred name, and they forget what the name means. They forget what we, as the body of Christ, the body of uh, the Messiah, is supposed to do. And we are going to um, we're going to look at the two different views. Um, <laughs> uh, I. I I'm gonna. I'm reading comments, guys. I know it looks like I'm blanking out, but I'm really not. I'm. I'm reading comments. We're gonna um, go over just the the last two views really quickly, and then we'll go to questions and answers. That that'll make things uh, run a little more smoothly. And then after um, the the question and answer segments over, like always, I am going to play uh, another Destiny Lab song. Um, I uh, actually have a, a pretty good one. Uh, lined up to play uh, tonight. Um, I'm going to play the original Sin from the original Sin album. And uh, I, I wouldn't say what song I was playing last week because I was playing a brand new song that had never been released. And if you haven't heard that, you can um, you can find that on Periscope at the end of the program. Um, I, I play the uh, a brand new Destiny Lab track that has not been released yet. Um, Ark and Neo, well, Ark told me I could. Archaeologic set gave me permission to play it on the Remnant Report last week, so I played it at the end of the program. Tonight we are going to be playing Original Sin at the end of the program. But amillennialism um, is, like I was saying, it, it, is, it can be deciphered by its title, A, um, preceding the millennium, A, before the millennium, uh, meaning that this view teaches that there is no future millennium at all and that the the millennial reign of Christ is going on right now, that there will be no future millennial earthly rule of Christ where he's sitting on David's throne. Uh, this stance also employs an allegorical interpretation and a non-literal approach to prophecy and scripture and the uh, events mentioned in the book of Revelation is being played out presently in the church age. Revelation reveals that the situation in the world will worsen before Christ returns. According to the amillennialist beliefs, Christ will one day return not to establish a millennial rule on earth, but to usher in the eternal state. Historical development of eschatology uh, says that before Christ returns, the world will get worse and worse and then eventually Christ will come back and judge the the dead and usher in the eternal state and you know it's important to to look at at these three views and where they came from um Karen asked the question where do the historicists get the this their view from and Again, the historicists are, have the post-millennial view, um, and they uh, they teach that the world's just going to get better and better, and it has to get good enough for Christ to come back. Pretty much, I mean that's that's me paraphrasing, but they the historicists um, view uh, it, it comes from the 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 Bible, but it's from their interpretations of revelation and uh, prophecy in general. It is definitely uh, it's man made interpretations. Of, you know the the it, that's why it's important. I, I think to look at where these views came from, how they were started, in order to uh, understand them and know which you know which view is the the view that that we should hold to um, the the view of historicism uh definitely it, it it comes from 
historically, it it the early church did not have this view. Um, the early church fathers uh, really had a a premillennial um, futurist view of at least the anti Nicene fathers. The ones that I have read um, had a um, a futurist view of prophecy and of eschatology and um, the view of of post millennialism. They believe that the millennium is, is an error. Uh, Joshua says it is two thousand years after the death, after the death of the Messiah makes himself known. Are you is that a question or are you saying that it's two thousand years? I'm sorry, Joshua, I didn't um, understand the the comment completely. I don't know if that's a question or if you're making a comment a statement. But post millennialist believes that the millennium is, is an era that uh, it's not a literal thousand years, but an era during which uh, Christ will reign over the earth, not from a literal and earthly throne, but through the gradual increase of the gospel and its power to change lives. That is historicist post-millennialism. Um, after this gradual Christianization of the world, Christ will then return and immediately usher the church into their eternal state after judging the wicked. This is called post-millennialism uh, because by its view, Christ returns after the millennium. Um, Joshua says, when... Makes himself seen. Okay. I understand that was a, a statement then, not a question. You're saying you were telling... Me when it comes makes himself seen. All right, the uh, I just didn't understand if it was a question or a comment. But um, the there are several different versions of historicism or post millennialism, and uh, the the one of the views gaining, I guess, the most popularity is the post-millennial um, view of the it's a theominous viewpoint and it it's really partial preterism um it's just what uh, we were talking about at the beginning of the program um and the partial preterist interpretation of revelation and the various judgment prophecies in the gospels uh believes that the majority of those prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD at the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the that view is saying that we are in the millennium now that Christ is ruling from his throne in but not the earthly throne his throne in heaven that at the ascension of Christ that, that he sat on his throne at the right hand of the father and has ruled for not a literal thousand years but uh an era of time that the millennium that the thousand years remember i said that both the his both a millennialism, which is the historicist point of view, and uh, post millennialism, which is preterism, they they both um, they both hold that um, the millennium is well, all of of prophecy is allegory. They don't hold a literal interpretation of prophecy. They hold a allegorical interpretation of prophecy. And, you know, I guess that there are a lot of things in Revelation that are definitely signs and symbols, but I think it's, that doesn't mean it can be interpreted figuratively. You know, the, the, just because it uses signs and symbols to tell the story of what's going to happen doesn't mean the the story that it's telling should be taken allegorically. And we're going to go to to scripture real quick and read Revelation chapter twenty, which is where all of these verses one through three is where all of these um, different views of the millennium they all come from from their their people's interpretations of this. Um, passage of scripture here and it says and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit 
and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And the... the the chapter 20 of Revelation, the entire chapter, that is the, the interpretation of chapter 20 of Revelation is um, the what makes up the different views of amillennialism, postmillennialism, and premillennialism. And um, like I said, the amillennialists, they believe that the, the kingdom of God was inaugurated at Christ's resurrection at which point he gained victory over Satan and the curse, which is, uh, of course, death, and that Christ is reigning uh, at the right hand of the Father over his church after the present, this present age which, that we are in has ended, Christ will return and immediately usher the church into the eternal state after judging the wicked. So you see that amillennialism and postmillennialism both share that view of the millennium that... Um, it's a millennialism says that there is no millennium. Okay, post millennialism says that the millennium is taking place, like, or excuse me, yeah, post millennialism says that the millennium is taking place right now, and after the millennium, which is not a literal thousand years, but a figurative era of time, and after the millennium, then uh, Christ will come again and usher in the eternal state and judge both the judge the the wicked dead and the the term amillennialism is um it's actually a a misnomer uh, uh for it implies it, it's a misnomer and it implies for that in the fact that it it implies that revelation uh 20 verses 1 through 6 should be ignored um the a, a millennialist view is by and large a view that pretty much interprets all of scripture as allegorically most people that that buy into this point of view i have found just the people that i know personally i'm not talking about anybody that, you know if any of you are listening to this and you know you hold to the amillennialist interpretation 
of prophecy, I am not talking about you. I'm only talking about the people that I know. And they hold the, the view and believe that, that a lot of Scripture is allegory. And a lot of Scripture is just like, for instance, hell. They do not believe in a literal hell. They believe um, that that is figurative for death. That is uh, allegory for death. And, you know, I really pray for these people and I fear for these people that one day they are going to find out the hard way that hell is not an allegory for death. It's a literal place. And, you know, although I do not believe, and I stated this emphatically earlier in the program, that we should not use this as a dividing point. We should not divide the body of Christ over the uh, the issue of eschatology when it comes to uh, the issue of whether scripture should be taken literally or figuratively um, we have to be very very careful uh, I, I don't want anybody to you know believe the wrong way and get a false sense of security when they they really have no reason to have that security to feel secure in their beliefs or in their particular brand of salvation. Um, you know, it's, it's important to take the Bible for what it says, you know, by, we are saved by grace through faith in Yeshua alone. Um, that, that is not a figurative statement. That is not a figurative, uh, point of scripture you know, we, uh, we look at, for instance, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, you know, when, when it talks about the Word, Jesus Christ was the Word. Yeshua was the Word. But um, if we looked at whether he's talking about the, the literal pages of Scripture, the literal words, the red letters that are written there, you know, you have to be smart. We know that it's not the literal letters there, but the word itself that John 1, 1 is talking about. Um, and, you know, we've gotten into this in the doctrine of Christ, how the, the word was the thought in the mind of the Father that was spoken from the mouth of the Father that created all things. And the... The word before it was spoken, it was thought. And that is the, the same, it's the exact same thing in taking this literal and figurative as uh, scripture. Unless, you know, Jesus taught in parables. But even when he told a, a parable, it was still to make a point and to teach a doctrine or to teach something. You know, he, he didn't speak in these parables for no reason, and he wasn't just speaking metaphorically. And unless something says that it is a parable or it is uh, an allegory, I think it, that scripture should be taken literally. And, you know, of course, I'm not here to tell anyone what they should believe or what they should do. I'm not here to make anybody's doctrine for them. I'm not here to make anybody's theology for them. I'm, tonight's program is simply just giving you all the, the different views and interpretations on the end times, the different eschatology interpretations. And, you know, I'll tell you guys, the, there are three really good places or two really good places that you can find um, the different views on eschatology and read every bit of it for yourself if you want to. You can go to, um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put it in the, um, the comment section after the program's over. I'm, uh, actually, I can probably go ahead and put it up now. If you go to the, the Blue Letter Bible and you type in, you go to blueletterbible.org and type in four views on the millennium then it will I'm just going to tell you what you can do that or you can just 
click on this link that I'm putting in the comments. FAQ forward slash millennium. There you go. I'm putting it up right now, guys. All right. There you can uh, click on the link that I just put in the comments and also you can go to uh, Logos. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Michael Heiser and the Logos Bible software, but um, the Logos website, the blog.logos.com, the Logos Talk, uh, it has uh, the, four diff the different four views of the end times and what they have in common and you know absolutely everything about the different end times views. And you can get all of the definitions and um, the where the different views started from and, you know, what different uh, early church father, the different views they believed. Um, you know, like, for, I'll give you an example. I, I'm on it now. And amillennialism uh, is um, uh, the, the view that we talked about earlier. Um, that is the same view that um, believes that there is no millennial, no millennium, and the it's got a millennial. It tells what the what they believe on the reign of Christ, the role of Satan, Israel, and the church. Um, it gives key passages that talks about it, um, like for instance, John five verse twenty eight and twenty nine, Romans eight seventeen through twenty three, Second Peter three verses three through fourteen, Second Thessalonians. 1 verse 5 through 10, each of those passages are key passages that the amillennialism uses to form the amillennialist view of uh, eschatology. And notable, notable uh, representatives of amillennialism, which I didn't realize this, um, but uh, Augustine of Hippo, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Louis Burkhoff, C.S. Lewis, and R.C. Sproul. And I really didn't know that, especially about R.C. Sproul. And they were all famous, notable uh, amillennialist and post-millennialist. Uh, post-millennialist, post um, it's got the same thing, the reign of Christ, the role of Satan, Israel and the church. The key passages for post-millennialism is Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, Matthew 13, verse 28, and John 12. And the notable representatives, notable uh, post-millennialists in the past are Jonathan Edwards, B.B. Warfield, Greg ba Boshnin, Bonshin, I don't know how you pronounce that, I'm sorry, Lorraine Bonetter, Bo Botner, excuse me, Lorraine Botner, Kenneth Gentry, Ken, Dr Ken Gentry is one, um, Peter Lyhart, and then premillennialism um, uses, uh, it's got the reign of Christ for it. Um, the role of Satan, Israel in the church, and it's, it doesn't give the key passages for premillennialism. It just says that this position shares many of the same key passages as amillennialism and postmillennialism, but the difference is it uses a, a distinction between the, the systems of interpretation. In other words, the, the, it interprets those same passages differently. Um, it takes a literal interpretation instead of a figurative and allegorical interpretation. But notative representatives of premillennialism are Arrhenius, Justin Martyr, Wayne Grudem, Robert Grundy, Ben Witherton III, and Craig Bloomberg. And then it's got dispensationalism, which is, of course, um, a form of premillennialism, but it's um, historic premillennialism. Um, it's not... Uh, it's not the the same as premillennialism. It's um, a little different because uh, it's goes by the um, the different uh, the reign of Christ, for example, for the majority of dispensationalists, the millennial reign of Christ will begin after his return at the end of a distinct seven-year period known as the tribulation. The millennial reign of Christ begins at the third coming of Christ. Like I was saying earlier, they believe in three 
uh, coming that Christ comes three times. Dispensationalists propose a secret rapture concept in which Christ returns prior to or midway through the tribulation period to remove the church from the earth. And notable, notable um, dispensationalists were Louis Schaefer, John Walvoord, Charles Ryer, Hal Lindsey, and John MacArthur. Uh, we're, you know, I, I, tonight's program's been very laid back. Um, I just kind of went through the different views of eschatology because, like I said, um, I've been, I know that there are a lot of, uh, uh people in the, um, in this truther community who are very familiar with, uh, the, the books that have come out recently from, um, well, he's actually been coming out with these books, uh, since at least 2014, I know for sure, um, the, the books from uh, Brian Gadawa, and I'm not bashing Brian Gadawa. I'm a huge fan of his, of his work, and you know, I, I know that from listening to his, uh, his, his testimony, in a sense, about his, eschatological, his es eschatology views, um, he, uh, he's gone through all of the different belief systems himself. So he says, um, I know that he was a dispensationalist. He came from a dispensationalist point of view, and you know, I know how easy it is to go from dispensationalism to another point of view once you find out what the other points of views are. And I don't know that that's why he did it, but I do know that, I, like I said in the beginning or earlier, that it's important to only take the truth from uh, these different views to, to find a happy medium, um, a honest medium. You know, the truth is always, you've got the right and the left, and the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And that's why I say find a happy middle, uh, a medium, because that is definitely going to be where the truth is going to be. And let the Holy Spirit guide you. Um, that is what the Holy Spirit is for, to bring all things to our remembrance. That's what Scripture says, that the Holy Spirit brings all things to our remembrance. And we need to rely on the Holy Spirit as an actual member of the Trinity, our triune God, our triune creator, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the set-apart spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. And we, a lot of times, I think we have a problem with forgetting about the Holy Spirit and not letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide our lives, but also form our doctrines and our theology and also our eschatology. And that is something that is extremely important for us to do. And, you know, I, like I said, I was not trying to uh, have, a, you know, a big program tonight. I just came on with you guys and it went through the, the different, views of eschatology and I'm gonna you know for the next 30 minutes I'm gonna have questions and answers maybe not even 30 minutes maybe 15 minutes uh, BDK says that Brian told him point blank that one of the main reasons he changed views was because of date setters you know what yes I um, I heard uh, in the one of the podcasts I heard him on uh, he was that was matter of fact I think it was on the Canary Cry podcast um, he was <laughs> Bash, you know, really, really, he didn't name names, but he was bashing date setters, the prophecy pundits. And, you know, there are way too many times there are people who use the things that are going on in the world and people's fears they and people's beliefs, they use that as a, a source of income. They play on people's fears and they play on people's hopes and people's beliefs, and they use it as a source of income, most definitely. And, uh, you know, I agree with uh, uh, Brian in that area that, you know, the, we should not be setting dates at all. Um, but I do like the fact that uh, Brian says also that he is not, um, he's not above changing his mind again. You know, he's not saying that he has got it 100% figured out that uh, I heard him say um, in one of the, the episodes that he, uh, if some if somebody convinced him or you know if if somebody laid it out and he was i can't remember exactly how he said it but that he was not dead set that he was right that he had it all figured out and you know i, I commend him for that i know that um 
I, I've heard a lot of people, you know, say a lot of things about Brian Gadawa, but you know, people can say what they want to. You know, they're gonna anybody that's in the spotlight is gonna get uh, bashed, and people are going to uh, hate on them for lack of a, a better way to put it. And that is definitely true. But if you've got a question or comment, definitely now's the the time to uh, put it in the the questions and the comment section. Um, Joshua says, "How much are you aware of how blood types play into everything, telling what everyone really is?" Um, not very much. Uh, I don't know much about blood types or how they play into everything, uh, especially not as far as the end times are concerned or eschatology. Um, I, I know you were uh, asking earlier about uh, the the or you were saying earlier about the historians getting the the year wrong. Uh, saying that they marked it at 33 A.D., but the correct year was 27 A.D. I'm curious to know exactly how it is you came up with that date of 27 A.D. Um, and uh, you said also, Joshua, it said that uh, in, 2020, or in 2027 is 2,000 years after Jesus, or uh, whatever way he pronounces Jesus after they slaughtered him the exact year, I'm very curious to know how, Joshua, you came up with that uh, date. Um, but I, uh, so um, you're talking, okay, you're talking about blood types the same way that uh, Gary Wayne talks about blood types. Um, or are you talking about uh, Nephilim? Okay, so Joshua, <laughs> Joshua says, uh, stay clear of O negative and B negative. Um, always ask people or beings their blood type uh well uh, i don't know about that joshua I don't, I don't know if we can uh say that uh a, a, a specific blood type is fallen angel blood um or serpent blood as you put it um you know i'm not saying you're wrong but I, i'm definitely not going to make that uh that statement um i uh I, um, I'd be very interested to know uh, how you came up with that as well. Um, Joshua says we can contact the Creator Himself, but humans are not supposed to know of it. Um, okay, well, uh, we can we can contact the Creator Himself every single day. We have. Um, a direct line to the Creator. We have a direct line to the Father through the Son. If you, uh, if you are in Messiah, if you have been born again and you are in the New Covenant with the Messiah, uh, then you can. You've got a direct line with the Father, and you can uh, contact the Creator Himself through the Father. Uh, you know. Uh, I don't know if that's what you meant, but that is definitely the case. Um, I know that not everyone is going to to know what it is you're talking about, Joshua, with the um, the bloodlines or contacting the Creator. I know that I'm not familiar with that. That it may be something that some people are familiar with, um, but I'm not. I I, um, I look at fringe topics and study fringe subjects just as you know, a lot actually, and I, I, I like um, I like studying those things. They're definitely fun to look at, but uh, it's kind of like the study of of aliens. You got to be careful uh, on what what it is you're looking at and, and the different statements you make. Um, you know, like some people say things like "all aliens are demons." Well, you know, not necessarily. So. I don't know, I guess we just have to, to be careful. But I am going to to take this time now, I'm going to play, um, I'm going to go ahead and play the song because I don't know if any of you have any more questions or not, but if you do have questions or comments, you can put them in there and we'll, we'll talk about them for a few minutes and I can definitely answer any of your questions as best I can. But until then, I am going to play this uh, song by... Destiny Lab, the original sin. Oh, 
reach the level of the avatars that Can you guys hear that okay? The Buddhas, Jesus, infinite ones, God. You witches so that you cast a spell upon this planet with your graven images and your wishes to be worshipped. Witches and warlocks flock like Harry Potter fans waiting for your new age plan to spread across the land. You got the masses up down where you want them, convinced that you don't exist and now you're kind of atheist. Some even think they're evolving to a godlike level above and beyond human. These rules are very in lies beyond ego and pride. They come disguised as an angel of light, like the original sin and the first deception. The tree in the garden, don't you see the connection? It's the same old lie. That he used back then at the beginning of time At the fall of man Have we forgotten the truth within the book of Genesis Ignorant of the nature of sin So we dismiss written words of God as an irrelevant myth But then embrace all these new age thoughts of nonsense It's not good or bad There's no God waiting to punish you Because you didn't want to tell it There is no God There is no God Welcome to the kingdom of heaven Without judgment Without hate I'm called my practices that they can worship in the fact exists. See through the smoke and the mist and the mist. From Atlantis to the American fanatical mist. To the UFO connection with the German SS. Secret society elitists from the east and the west. Illuminati and Masonics, man, it all connects. Satanic worship to the depths, we don't want to admit. It's a globalized illusion that we gotta correct. Check the symbols and signs like the all and I. Read the vinyl facts to understand the great design. See the writing on the wall, we're living in end times. And even the elected now bought into the lie. Real Satanists are dressed up in their suits and ties, eating the fruit like these fools who think they are divine. They aren't evolved, they're just blinded by ego and pride, living a lie that disguised like Jekyll and Hyde. Can you deny that this times were all prophesied? Read Matthew 24, 24, you decide. It's no such thing as good or bad. We're judging the environment of the issue of that. There are things that I do, and I know they're involved. There are other things that are not involved. But it's not good or bad. There's no God waiting to punish you. See you later, BDK. Thanks for tuning in, my friend. That was uh, Destiny Lab, the song Original Sin off the Original Sin album. And uh, guys, you can go to destinylab.com to find um, all of their music. I I, uh, <laughs> I love the truth music, man. I really do. Uh, Joshua says, yeah, you're right. We are only supposed to meditate when seeking the creator. We are only supposed to meditate when seeking uh, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever you would like to call our creator. Um, if anyone meditates for any other reason, it can force open the pineal, making them disobedient. Uh, well, I don't know much about that, but you are definitely correct about um, uh, us only supposed to meditate in prayer when seeking the Father or seeking Yahweh. And I would definitely not suggest anyone get into uh, meditation for any other reason because it's definitely something that can open up doorways, Joshua, for sure. Um, you know, people get into meditation, yoga, the kundalini, um, and without even realizing it, they uh have they open up a doorway for a uh, fallen entity or a demon you know to come in and to oppress them and even in some cases possess them depending on uh you know what they're doing and where they're at and that is certainly a danger for sure and I would advise 100% against it. I'd stay away from it completely. And I definitely rebuke all of it. And I am going to take this time to just say a few words in prayer. I'm going to close us in prayer. And we are going to end tonight's program. I think we had a pretty laid back session tonight. Um, we gained some knowledge. And we looked at a, you know, some people might say, a uh, boring issue, but I don't think so. I think that the study of the end times is probably one of the the it's my one of my, it's my favorite study in uh, of the different I guess fringe is not the word, but the different subjects of scripture and the stu subjects of the Bible to study the different topics, the different books, the the prophetical books, and the study of prophecy itself is a uh, Definitely 
it's the my favorite study to I mean my favorite subject to study and I, I love prophecy. I love the, the study of the end times. I love eschatology. Um thinking about the return of our Savior. Um, you know, I, I can't wait for Christ's return. And I think that we should all be looking forward to it and that we should all be trying to to win as many brothers and sisters uh into the kingdom. We should spread the gospel as much as we can and we should grow the kingdom to the best of our ability and as much as we possibly can. And with that being said, and those final words said, I'm going to close us in prayer, and we are going to end tonight's program. Father, I come before you now, and I thank you so much for each and every man, woman, and child who came together with us tonight to learn about the the subject of eschatology, to learn the, the different views of eschatology. And I thank you so much for the gift of your word that you've given us that we can go to and we can read all of the amazing things that you have done. And we can also go to prophecy and see the things that you are still going to do. And Father, I thank you so much for giving me the the remnant report to be able to reach out to the different people all over the country and even people in other countries all over the world father and i i thank you for this platform i pray that you will bless this platform and bless the entire network the entire next chapter family and network I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters at the Next Chapter Radio Network and also for all of my brothers and sisters and family in the kingdom who listen each week to both the podcast and the video versions of the Remnant Report. Father, I pray that you just bless each and every person who can hear the sound of my voice. And I pray that if they have not already received Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, into their heart and been born again, that today would be the day that they make that decision to become born again and to live the rest of their lives for you spreading the gospel, and growing the kingdom. Father, I thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And it's in Yeshua's name I pray and ask all of these things. Amen and amen. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the Remnant Report tonight. Until, let's see, next week we are going to, we'll be on Friday next week. Uh, We will be on Friday on Periscope. Um, It will be on at 8.30 p.m. Friday on Periscope. Don't miss next week's program. We'll be back on the Doctrine of Christ. Also, tune in next week to the Deception Report with Mary Callie and Tori. And also, guys, if you haven't already uh, listened and caught the, the, uh, oh, my mind just went blank, the Omega Frequency uh, with BDK on the Fourth Watch Radio Network, be sure to check that out. It comes on uh, the the podcast is on. Uh, you can find it on Spreaker, and also, you know, they they've got the um, Fourth Watch uh, Radio Network. Um, it's got an app, uh, probably in both Apple for iPhones and for uh, Android. I'm sure there's an Android app as well. Um, and you can um, you can also catch that uh, the Omega Frequencies. BDK's got. Um, the Friday night program that or Friday afternoon program comes on live. The um, heralding the end comes on live. Um, And you know, that that's uh, a program that I try to, to catch as much as I can. Um, Also BDK has got a a YouTube channel out the Omega frequencies, YouTube channel. But I, a lot of times I have to watch the re or listen to the replay because I'm getting ready for, my program on Friday evening. So a lot of times I have to catch the the replay, but, um, also 
If you are not already a member of Remnant Warriors and or in Jesus' name we stand, um, guys, I seriously would recommend you going and becoming a member of Remnant Warriors, the group we have on Facebook, and also in Jesus' name we stand. Both really good groups that are growing. Um, you know, they're both fairly new groups. Remnant Warriors um, is only a few months old, uh, but we're growing. We're trying to get some new things started. Um, in Jesus' name we stand. It's fixing to start uh, a Bible study, a weekly Bible study that we're going to be doing. Um, so, and there's, you know, there's always really good topics posted in both groups. Um, you know, there's really good articles and post up. So, you know, at least go check it out. I have taken uh, Remnant Warriors and I've changed it from private to public just for right now so more people can see it. And also people were wanting to share things out of Remnant Warriors and they couldn't because it was private. And I was trying to tell them how to how they could do it by screenshotting, but I, I just figured I'd go ahead and make it public right now while the group's go, growing. But that is going to do it for this edition of the Remnant Report. Until next week, I am your host, the Remnant Warrior, saying good night and God bless.